Now, I'm very glad to introduce our first speaker today, Professor Michael Cusimano, who is a Sloan Management Review Distinguished Professor of Management and also a Deputy Dean of Sloan School of Management. He is a world-renowned expert in corporate strategy, innovation leadership, and digital platforms. He published a book that's called Business of Platforms. I would say that's a must-read book for everyone who wants to practice digital transformation and innovation. Let's welcome Professor Kusumano. Thank you, Graham. Okay, so I hope I'm on the system. So Graham was actually one of my students many years ago, and I think I actually recommended that you join IOP, and that was at a time when there were no Chinese companies uh, in IOP. And now China might be number one in terms of, in terms of companies, I don't know. But uh, thank you, Graham. And Carl, as well, has been a colleague for many, many years. Um, let's see, this was supposed to be straightforward. But uh, let me talk about, no, that's not straightforward. There it goes. Uh, let me talk about the most recent book, but I'm going to extend the discussion a bit further as well. OK? So the book came out in 2019. It's now translated into half a dozen languages. We go through what is platform thinking. Uh, the word platform is used in so many different contexts. We actually offer a particular definition. We have a framework for trying to understand what types of industries and in what conditions go toward a winner-take-most type of dynamic or winner-take-all. Um, we talk about how you build a platform business, common mistakes that people make, uh, entrepreneurs or even uh, big companies. We have a chapter on old dogs and new tricks, which is can we teach old companies to think like uh, digital platform companies, and how do you do that? I have another chapter on double-edged swords. Uh, the negatives and, as well as the positives of platforms, and I'll talk a bit about that today, too. And then also a little bit about uh, the kinds of platforms we can expect to see in the future, and I'll uh, expand on that today as well. So there's not a lot of time, but I'll do the best that I can. First point to make, I've made this a number of times before over the past 25 years, platforms are emerging everywhere. Now they basically dominate uh, all, tech, all high technologies. Um, and you know, computers and smartphones, we're used to that, social media, but even things like the industrial internet of things, sharing economy, payment systems, web services, really platforms are everywhere and they're working with other platforms and on top of other platforms. The granddaddy of all platforms is really the internet at this point. So what, is, what do we mean by the term platform? Uh, and what do we mean by a platform company? So usually we have a list here of some of the most valuable companies in the world being platform companies. Uh, when we look at lists of unicorns, uh, we see maybe 60 to 70% of those billion dollar companies are also platforms in one form or another. Um, so platforms are really everywhere. The investors have jumped on the bandwagon of a lot of platforms. And I'm gonna talk about when that makes sense and when it doesn't make sense. So first, in terms of definitions, what do we mean by the term platform? And again, people have been writing about this for decades. I even wrote a book in the 1990s about platforms in the automobile industry. Uh, and that was very different. That was about product platforms, building an underbody and multiple models based on common components. But the way we've come to use the term platform is, is broader. It goes beyond the company. It's a foundation beyond the company, for the most part, uh, and it could be a product or a service, but it is a foundation that many different individuals or corporations or other organizations can use to exchange information or to create and sell different types of goods, which we call complementary products to the actual platform. So the best example are apps for an iPhone, right? Those applications are complementary to the platform, which is the iPhone. The more apps you have, the more valuable that platform becomes. An early platform was the telephone, right? The more users you have, the larger the network, the more valuable uh, the telephone as a, as a network becomes. So this 
this dynamic is what we call network effects. So there has to be some positive feedback loop where there is growing value to either the users of the platform directly or indirectly as there are more users or more complementary products and services that leverage the platform. So the investors get excited because the kind of growth we're talking about here is, is not linear, it's, it's potentially exponential. And uh, again, so that's how you see Facebook grow from two users to nearly three billion users in just a, a short period of time. It's through those network effects. And the platform is essential. That technology in the middle is essential because the interactions or the innovations would not occur, or at least not occur so easily without that platform in the center. Okay, so that's why these platform companies have become so valuable. Again, I just want to reinforce the difference between the old way of talking about platforms uh, and this more modern way of talking about platforms, although Again, we started writing about these in the 1990s. But the old type of platform is a, this hierarchical type of structure. It's really a product platform, maybe extending to a supply chain. So there's an original equipment manufacturer at the top, for example, an automobile company, and they have a series of suppliers. And innovation is largely through specifications and contracts. So yes, there is a network of suppliers, but the innovation process is not open, it's closed managed by the company, controlled by contracts. And usually, like an automobile company, will have a few hundred suppliers in this kind of network. But what happened, beginning really with uh, Microsoft and DOS and then Windows, uh, we began to see this broader ecosystem. And we began using the term ecosystem in the late 1990s and early 2000s, where the platform is, at, is a technology uh, it's at the center of this, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. It's at the center of this more nebulous network of users and uh, complementers, companies that are using their own R&D to create a product or service that leverages some features or functions in the platform or the user base of the platform. And you have other kinds of partners, for example. So this distinction we're making here is between a product platform, which could be extended to a supply chain, and an industry platform, which is similar. There are also reusable building blocks that companies can take and build products around. But it's open to this much broader global network. And so this is how we get millions of applications available on a Google Android phone or an iPhone from Apple or a Windows uh, computer in this model here, this nebulous industry platform model that could never be done in a hierarchical, hierarchical uh, controlled pyramid type of platform or product platform model. Okay, so that, these are just some basics. Now, the problem, uh, or at least what makes platforms interesting is that all sorts of platforms have emerged. Uh, the first one that I studied and wrote about in 1995 in a book called uh, Microsoft Secrets was about DOS and Windows as an innovation platform where other companies built applications around, uh, including Microsoft. Uh, and then later, uh, after 1995, after uh, Netscape browser and Internet Explorer browser was available, we saw a bunch of companies creating different kinds of marketplaces on the Internet. So we have marketplaces as, a, as another kind of platform. But we've used the same term, uh, platform, for these kinds of companies, and they're radically different, an operating system versus an Amazon marketplace. But what do they have in common? So the first thing they have in common, and the reason why we've used this industry platform concept, is that they bring two or more sides or actors in a market together. Okay, these are key market participants. In the case of Windows or the smartphones, it's bringing together users with these third-party innovators of complementary products and services. They would not be able to connect or connect so easily without that platform in the middle. Um, in the case of an Amazon marketplace, it's bringing together buyers and sellers. Right? There's no other way Amazon could sell a million different books in 1995 or 500 million products today without this kind of marketplace function. They could not warehouse uh, so many products or buy and resell so many products on their own. Second, 
all of these types of platforms generate network effects. And we could say that the most value they get is from the network effects. Now, a marketplace can also create value by buying goods or linking buyers and sellers at low prices, for example. But it's the number of large number of buyers attracting a large number of sellers, or a large number of sellers attracting a large number of buyers, or similar in an in a operating system. That dynamic is unique to industry platforms. We don't see that dynamic in product platforms or supply chain platforms. <clears throat> and I should just define direct network effects or same side as when users are connecting with other users and that creates a separate value, like with Facebook, friends of friends of friends and friends of friends of friends, etc. like the telephone network. Indirect network effects, I'll give you an example of, but that's connecting users with advertisers or uh, third-party application developers with users. Third, all of these platforms have to solve a chicken or egg problem to get started. And this is where that special value comes. One of the different problems in platform businesses is that if the value is coming from linking multiple sides, how do you get started when there's no population on either side, right? So we have a long discussion of how you get started. You have to either create value for one side first, and then that can attract another side, uh, or you have to kind of zigzag across the sides, create little value at a time, or feed each uh, side a little bit at a time. Credit cards had this problem. How do you start a credit card business? Well, you've got to deliver machines to process the credit cards. Uh, nowadays, we have a different technology, but in the old days, you had to seed all the merchants with uh, machines, and also on the other side, you had to send out cards, credit cards, to your better customers. And your banks did that a little bit at a time, kind of zigzagging across the two sides, and then eventually, you have enough merchants that accept cards and enough people with cards that the credit card companies could actually charge merchants to pay for that. So credit cards is an example of an older industry platform, but the dynamics are very much described by chicken or egg problems, and they're all common. It gets very complicated with some of the more complicated platforms, and that's why I like to say it's, it's kind of like playing three-dimensional chess. The, the business models are different from just creating a great product or service and selling it, because your success may actually depend on what third parties do. Right? So that's a very, very different business model. OK, the other major innovation in, in the research and by the way, these slides will be available uh, to anyone. It may be hard to see this. Again, we've been looking, my co-authors and I, David Yaffe from Harvard Business School and Annabelle Gower, uh, who was a former doctoral student of mine. She now teaches at University of Surrey and Oxford in England. Uh, we decided we would divide all platforms into two types. One type are transaction platforms. Uh, and these are exchanges of information or goods, and the platform company will take a piece of that transaction. The other kind of platform is the first type that I had studied, which we now call innovation platforms. So we did a book in 2002, Annabelle and I, called Platform Leadership. It was about driving industry-level innovation uh, at Microsoft, at Intel, and Cisco, NTT Docomo, a few other companies. So these are... Uh, distinctive types of platforms. Let me go back here. But then we have this group in the middle that are hybrid companies, which means they have both a transaction platform and an innovation platform. They may have started on one side and then added the other type of platform. But it is this uh, hybrid approach that we think is incredibly powerful. And it's, it's become fairly simple to do this. Now, let's take Apple, for example. The Apple iOS, the uh, operating system for the iPhone and tablets, is essentially an innovation platform with the iPhone. Um, so this is driving tremendous amount of business. But the Apple App Store, which is now under attack, actually, in the courts, um, is essentially a transaction platform. It is a mechanism for bringing together buyers and sellers of, of these applications, buyers and 
buyers are the users. Okay, so that combination of an app store with the innovation platform has made Apple especially powerful. Amazon has a number of different uh, innovation platforms and also different uh, transaction platforms and services. Pretty much all companies seem to be moving in this direction of a hybrid approach, okay? Um, the other uh, kind of remarkable result that came out of our study is that platform companies, particularly when they are successful, uh, are remarkably successful. Um, because they're leveraging assets outside the firm, they can grow at tremendous rates and uh, achieve astounding levels of revenues with relatively small numbers of people. Uh, again, relative to the amount of revenues. So we did a study when we started this in 2015 of uh, the top um, publicly listed platform companies. We identified 43 we limited them to companies that were in the platforms associated with um, internet businesses or smartphones or personal computers. So we excluded the older platform types like credit cards. Um, our control sample were about were 100 companies in the same businesses as the platform companies. They each had about four and a half billion dollars in revenues. Uh, the details are, are in the uh, book and the appendix. Uh, but the platform companies achieved those revenues with half the number of employees. They had twice the sales growth rates. They had almost twice the operating profits and about three times the market value. Okay, and the market value was associated with growth rates and, and profits. So, again, it's, it's not easy to become one of these global industry platforms. But if you can make it, uh, it's an incredibly powerful uh, business model. So we have some more general advice that if you're a product company and you see the potential for having some opening to third parties to build uh, additional products or services that may enhance your basic product, then try an innovation platform strategy. Uh, I remember having conversations with a, a company recently that was um, uh, building heating and controlling systems. Actually, they're an ILP member. Uh, and the idea was, well, there's a lot of different analytics and payment systems and remote control systems that could be added to their, their heating and controlling systems. They don't have the technology themselves to do it, but if they created APIs, programming interfaces, and allowed third parties to come in and enhance their systems, not just as contracted suppliers, but kind of an open innovation model, they can actually build a new type of innovation platform with uh, some transaction elements. Uh, fold it into it. So that's an example of introducing an innovation platform for a product company. Also, if you're a service uh, business, you have to think about, well, can you generate more value not by actually creating and delivering the service yourself, but possibly being a transaction platform where you link people that have assets to rent, for example, with people that want to rent those assets. So Airbnb is a perfect model here. Rather than buying or building hotels or contracting for 50 years to run these properties, why not just become a broker, essentially, but create a marketplace so that there's potential network effects, lots of sellers with lots of potential buyers or renters. So that's a services business. And where can you do this in different industries, different markets is the question. But we think this can be done uh, far more often than you might think. OK. So now I am stuck. This is not moving forward. OK, there we go. Um, some other quick points here. If a market becomes platformized, then it's going to be the company with the better platform that will win, not the best product or service. And I, I realized this when I was studying 30 years ago, why the Apple Macintosh computer lost to Microsoft DOS computers, DOS Intel computers, not Windows. It was DOS, clunky, old, horrible DOS, if you remember. But it was cheap and powerful, and there were millions of applications available for DOS, at least by, by the mid-1990s, DOS and Windows. Uh, also, I've studied this in a number of other industries. You know, who would have thought that the taxi industry would become platformized? And now it has been. So if you're a taxi company, you have to figure out, you have to be an old dog that learns new tricks, and you have to develop your own app, your own on-demand service, uh, some way to compete with Uber and Lyft, for example. 
So those are examples of markets that have become platformized. Hotel companies are all moving into sharing economy types of businesses with, with apartments, for example, or rooms, and that's a way they can compete with uh, these digital companies that have emerged, like Airbnb. All right, so in the book, we take you through how you actually build a platform business. You've got to figure out, step one, which market size are you trying to bring together? Before that, you have to figure out, are you trying to encourage innovation around your product? Or are you trying to get a piece of transactions, like service businesses, that could be associated with your product or service? Or do you want to do a hybrid strategy? So with that in mind, you need to figure out which side you're trying to bring together. How are you going to get the chicken or egg problem solved? You have to start somewhere. You've got to attract people on the other side. You know, how did Facebook get started, for example? Think about that. How did Airbnb get started? We have a lot of those case studies. And then third, if you get this far, you have to figure out how are you going to make money. That's the business model. And then fourth, you need to figure out how you're going to govern the platform if you get that far as well. Um, so Facebook is a good example. They actually started out as a one-sided platform, just linking users to other users and other users and other users. Now, it's interesting. They could have charged for access to a platform like a social uh, club uh, might do in the real world. But the genius of Mark Zuckerberg at that time, he's also, he also has his faults, as we've learned, uh, was not to charge, but to make it free. Right? And once he built up the user side, um, then he added a second side, which he monetized, advertisers. Right? Now, again, the genius here, he opened up a third side. This was after Microsoft invested in the company around 2007, kind of turned Facebook into a platform for building different applications. There are actually, a number of years ago, we looked at it, and there were already 10 million different applications or web services accessible through the Facebook platform, the set of APIs. Um, and those APIs also give access to data on users to the advertisers. The more applications you have, the more time people spend on the platform. That's more information for advertisers. You make these databases available. And then, of course, bringing in platform partners, digital partners. So the direct network effects are just around users, right? Friends and friends of friends or family, et cetera, they bring in all their friends. But all the rest of this are indirect network effects. And it's like an ongoing flywheel, which creates these, this tremendous value for the users. Now, there's, there's also opportunity, many opportunities, to abuse this kind of power. So that's the first problem I'm just going to talk about briefly. Um, Illicit usage of the user data, antitrust actions all over the world for all these platform companies. You know, antitrust, if, if you get big enough and powerful enough to attract the attention of antitrust authorities around the world, in some ways, you know, you're, you're getting punished for success. But we also want to impose or at least hold these platform companies to newer types of standards of behavior that they have not followed in the past. So we have a lot of these actions. Uh, some of these companies have competed maybe unfairly, like Uber has argued it's not a taxi company. Airbnb has said, you know, we're not a, uh, we're not a hotel company. Facebook has said we're not a publisher. And so they've avoided different rules and regulations or insurance requirements or liability lawsuits uh, that those companies are, are liable for. But are they special or not? You know, is Uber just a technology app, or is it really in the transportation business? I think it's in the transportation business and should be regulated like transportation companies. So we're still sorting out those kinds of issues and also labor and the gig economy. Uh, if you don't hire people as full-time employees, it costs 20 to 30 percent less. That also gives these digital platforms an economic advantage. So the problem of platform power is a big one. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with Section 230, uh, Communications Decency Act of 1996, which allows platforms that disseminate information. This is mostly a social media uh, problem or issue. Uh, they cannot be held responsible for disseminating information. Only the creators of the content can be. So they're kind of given this exemption from any kind of liability or libel uh, uh, lawsuits for content. And some people think that you know, even though that was important in the early years, more recently it's become a problem because the lack of consequences for these companies, like Facebook, for promoting or disseminating 
uh, these conspiracy theories or false information about health of the election. By the way, that material goes viral very quickly, and when people are angry, they click on all sorts of different ads. So these are billion-dollar machine-making tools for these social media companies, but there's no real moral consequences for it. So lots of government actors and others are now stepping and criticizing them, saying that we need to hold these companies responsible. We need to revise Section 230 or do other things. Otherwise, we're destroying the internet as a common resource. Okay, so regulation is difficult for these companies because the technology moves very fast, the government doesn't really have experts on the technology as well as the law, and then everything is, is changing, it's a moving target. So we've been arguing that we need some more government oversight and changes in some of the regulations. But we also need companies to step up with more self-regulation, that they have to understand that if they don't control what goes on on these platforms, they can actually destroy uh, the platforms, which is a common resource for all of us. And in other industries, movies, video games, airline reservations, advertising for, for tobacco and alcohol, Government has put pressure on companies, and companies have formed coalitions and standards and codes of conduct, and they've regulated themselves under pressure on the, the recognition that they're going to destroy their markets if they don't do something to create a more healthy environment. So we think this has got to happen with uh, platform companies, and I've been spending a lot of time on that. So in four minutes. We talk about the other problem, which I, we call in our book platform mania, and that is uh, people create platforms around all sorts of businesses, and they think because they create a platform, it's going to become a good business. But platformizing a bad business doesn't make it a good business. And by bad business, I mean a, a, a business with low profit margins. So you know, onboarding people for Uber, for example, or even Airbnb, Airbnb is different because you're accessing digital assets that are unused. But Uber or Lyft are providing a physical service, whether they're delivering food or people. It's expensive to find those people, keep them on the flywheel, et cetera. And those kinds of services, even though they're onboarded and the payment is done digitally, they're not digital services. So they don't produce the same kinds of um, profits that selling digital goods do, like what Facebook does, digital advertisements, or Microsoft digital software, or Amazon digital services. So that's been a problem, and uh, uh, so we need to really think about where are we creating platforms, when are they likely to raise money. Investors have jumped on the bandwagon for all these platforms, but in many cases, Platforms do well when they solve an industry demand problem of linking buyers and sellers or two or more parts of a market. If a platform has to succeed just by subsidizing one or two sides forever, then the bigger it gets, the more money it's going to lose. And that's essentially what has happened to Uber. Uber. In that case, the platform is not growing via network effects. It's growing via subsidies or low prices. And that's... That's a recipe for, for disaster. The bigger it gets, the more money it loses. Um, so we've seen these examples. You know, Uber, it is bringing together two sides, but keeping drivers on the platform is really difficult. They have to make, keep making payments. There's a lot of competition. They brought in other partners, but they're essentially subsidizing drivers and riders at a very high rate. Um, Everyone has gotten these little messages in your email, right, or your, on your phone, your $30 coupon for a free, free meal, et cetera. Drivers are getting paid a couple thousand dollars just to, to stay on the flywheel to drive because you can't have Uber without drivers being available. You can have riders, but you need those drivers to be there. Uber's entire uh, business model is having rides available essentially on demand on your phone whereas it's not the case with taxis. So that requires a lot of drivers. Drivers have quit at very high numbers. It costs Uber several billion dollars a year just to subsidize uh, the driver's side. And that's not talking about subsidies yet for the, for the riders. So the bigger it gets, the more money it loses. We have other kinds of businesses that people have thought could be platformized, like bike sharing in China. This is not really a platform. It's just a company buying bicycles and renting them out at below cost. And the company owns the assets. It's not linking people with bicycles with people that want to borrow the bicycles, which is another model. Docomo tried that uh, in Japan. 
But essentially, this is, this is a graveyard uh, for, for the used bicycles. Uh, and it's a terrible business model. WeWork is also terrible. It's just renting rooms and renovating them at high cost and then re-renting them at lower prices. There's no network effects in either of these businesses. So they're, they're kind of like one-sided platforms, but uh, they really make no, much, no sense uh, from, a, from a, a perspective that I'm talking about. So some final thoughts on the business model. First, you should start with a good product or service. You know, Chinese bike rentals is not a good product, not a good service. It needs to be subsidized by someone. Maybe a city can subsidize it to reduce pollution, but that's a different business model. Target an industry where there's a market failure of connecting two, two or more sides. Uh, that's where a platform business can be useful. Uh, you do need to choose an innovation or transaction or hybrid strategy, but once you do that, you want to build an ecosystem around that core product or service. You do have to subsidize, in most cases, the most important side. For example, Facebook makes access for users free. It makes uh, access for application developers free. But it charges advertisers, and it has a barter arrangement with digital partners or content partners. But there has to be some kind of subsidies, subsidies to break the chicken or egg problem and get started. But once you've launched, once you're growing, you want to gradually reduce that subsidy and grow through network effects. Or you can keep the subsidy like free access for Facebook users as long as you can fully monetize uh, the network effects through another side, like charging advertisers. But if you're only surviving on below cost prices or two-sided subsidies, it's a recipe for losing lots and lots of money. It's a great way to lose money, by the way. All right, so I have a, I believe I have a, a few minutes, quickly a few minutes left, and then we'll have some Q&A. So what's going on in the future? And we devote a chapter to this, and we've been writing some other articles, one in Slow Management Review. We clearly think that the future is hybrids. Whenever companies build an innovation platform, there's going to be, it's going to be paired with a transaction platform, maybe even vice versa. Um, these firms, due to network effects, they're going to get bigger and more powerful, which means we have to worry more and more about regulation and standards. And we're seeing a whole bunch of new enabling technologies that have become the source for different platforms. So, artificial intelligence and machine learning in the home, as well as in the automobile and the enterprise, uh, self-driving vehicles connected with industrial internet of things types of platform technologies, uh, I'm experimenting looking at gene editing, different types of technologies there, and I'll say a bit about that. And also quantum computing is another new area that we write about, and I've been writing about this, and also IOP has been holding some webinars on that as well. So the self-driving cars, there's a bunch of technologies, and data is very critical here. It's still in the phase of a group or company platform. We don't see any industry-wide platform. And some companies like Tesla are just going it alone. But there's a lot of potential for the core technologies, like the, the chips and software being provided by Intel Mobileye, to become maybe the basis, or the chips provided by NVIDIA, to become the basis for an innovation platform, where companies add more technologies, and through APIs, they can share more of the analytics and, and uh, analysis of the data more broadly. Uh, there could also be a transaction platform for a sharing economy, self-driving cars, autonomous driving, like, a, like Lyft and uh, Uber have been experimenting with, but more around uh, the self-driving technology or even robo-taxis that are called automatically. So Intel Mobileye is experimenting with that. We're going to see some attempts at this. They may not succeed, but at least they're coming. Uh, biotech has more complicated technologies like CRISPR are really toolkits. But I've been talking with a number of uh, pharmaceutical companies and also the MIT Center on Biological uh, Innovation. Um, there are potential for reusable modules or plasmids. Uh, actually, the very rapid development of vaccines followed a kind of a platform strategy where we understand these different proteins, such as in the coronavirus, uh, and can very quickly spin off different variations of treatments from the vaccines, different diagnostics, pills for dealing directly with the virus. So that's still kind of a company uh, platform strategy, but some prop platformization could occur beyond individual firms where a number of firms collaborate for sharing some of the technology or different services for, um, for um, 
testing and clinical trials, commercialization, and not only the innovation side. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, biotech is, is very much a competitive industry around these patent races, so cooperation is, is more difficult than we saw uh, in the IT industry. And finally, quantum computers, uh, which I've been following for almost 20 years now from the very beginning. These are not digital technologies, by the way. These are more like analog technologies with some various digital interfaces. But as you've probably heard uh, a number of times, um, uh, circuits can represent zero or one. They have this telepresence notion that's also going on, correlated qubits at a distance. So they have a lot of very strange but very powerful properties. So we do predict that there will be, and, and actually it's not even a prediction, it's already going on. There's already a platform battleground going on between the basic architectures, between the analog types of computers, say, built by D-Wave, and the more general purpose uh, gate array technologies built by Microsoft and IBM and a number of other firms. And so they're trying to build ecosystems around their their particular technology platforms, working with universities and others. And there's also transaction platforms, uh, opportunities here, encryption services, secure communication services. People will not probably buy quantum computers, but they'll buy quantum computing services, again, for encryption and communications, possibly for other services like optimization uh, and simulation. Okay, so that's how we predict that will go. Okay, and China is already leading in a number of areas there. All right, so finally, some conclusions. Not every product or service will become platformized, but many of them will. And so it depends on how creative you are in thinking about platform opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities uh, that present ways to save money here. You don't have to do all the innovation yourself or through contracts with suppliers. You don't have to own all the assets you need to build your business. You can use this transaction or innovation platform approach. Uh, there's more ways to make money. You can monetize one side and not another side, but there's also more ways to lose money, right? So you have to be careful about that. And we often say, well, the winners turned out kind of through this random lucky process, but if we study the history of these companies, there was usually very specific deliberate decisions that they made to get where they are. And uh, companies that have just disappeared uh, have often been the ones that made uh, pretty glaring mistakes. Okay, so that's my story for today, and we have a, almost on time, a few minutes for some Q&A, right? I think. Okay, thank you. How are we managing that? Oh, so I, I just read these and respond. So what influences how one good idea for a platform business succeeds and another one does not? So we do have a framework for trying to understand the winner take all or most dynamics. So you have to be able to create strong network effects is the first thing. Uh, and not all these platforms create strong network effects. Second, you have to, uh, and this is also unique to platform businesses, you have to try to limit what we call multi-homing. That is the user or complementers using more than one platform as their home. So, you know, Facebook becomes so powerful because that becomes the home for people doing social media, or LinkedIn becomes the home for professional uh, uh, linkages, or Amazon Marketplace becomes your shopping home if you want to go shopping, and that's also combined with an online store. So you need to figure out how to do those two things. And, uh, and that's specific to platform strategy, other elements, our more conventional strategy, you've got to think about creating barriers to entry um, to keep out the competition. So there's, um, there's lots of things that go into that. And sometimes timing is, I've been part of many platforms that were just too early, for example, and they just disappeared. So timing is important as well. Um, okay, so I see, how do you manage multi-homing? So that's actually, nobody's voting about that, so. That's important, though. <laughs> Good examples of manufacturing. Can Ethereum or crypto be considered a platform? Uh, so Ethereum may be, but uh, the blockchain technology is another enabling. Uh, well, it's an enabling technology. So then you've got to create a platform around that. 
So yes, the whole Ethereum technology or even Bitcoin with uh, the different transactions that are involved, uh, that, is a kind, that is a platform for exchange. There's definitely network effects associated with that. The more uh, merchants or individuals that can accept uh, that type of uh, cryptocurrency, then the more people you will have using it. So there's definitely a platform element to that. Chicken or egg, they've, they've solved the chicken or egg. Uh, good examples of manufacturing companies successfully transitioning into digital platform companies, uh, not growing much through network effects. So it's, it's tough here. Uh, we don't really, I don't have a lot of good examples of that. You know, we've had some noble attempts like General Electric with the Predix uh, Industrial Internet of Things platform. That didn't really work for uh, other companies because companies were reluctant to share data with General Electric. Uh, and this was again a, a platform creating different services around their industrial equipment, whether it's aircraft engines or locomotives or other kinds of uh, uh, factory automation systems. Um, but uh, so that has evolved more into a, a, um, a company platform for its own products and services with some partners outside. So it's, it's still a valuable investment for General Electric, but it has not uh, gone beyond them. So Siemens and uh, Schlumberger and a bunch of other companies are trying to do something similar. So there's a lot of activity around industrial Internet of Things. Uh, we have written a little bit about that. My own belief is that it's going to be the cloud platforms like Amazon or Microsoft Azure that end up dominating the more generic industrial Internet of Things infrastructure platform. And some of the industrial companies will build kind of groups around some of their technologies. It would be more of a partnership strategy than an open Internet. Um, so when can you claim to have a platform? Well, everybody claims to have a platform. How many reach the status of industry-level platforms sustained through network effects? There aren't that many of them in the world. Uh, there's probably just a, well, there might be 100 at this point that we can really say are global, important, multi-billion dollar platforms. A bunch of them are private, a bunch of them are public. But there's a lot of companies that have smaller initiatives around platforms. I mentioned the heating and controlling system company, for example. Um, so there are ways to use a platform strategy to enhance what you're doing, even if you don't quite get to the level of a global industry platform. How do decentralized platforms like Bitcoin impact the economics of the marketplace? Um, well, so uh, how is Bitcoin impacting the world? So what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and peer-to-peer -peer technologies are doing, they're basically taking money out of the hands of banks. Okay, so the ability of banks to charge transaction fees is going to be severely depressed by all of these new peer-to-peer -peer technologies. And you can also look at some other cases where companies have sold technology that helps them manage uh, contracts and other peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, relationships. So blockchain will kind of substitute for those. Um, open source did the same thing when uh, some companies selling uh, uh, like a CRM product for free and you have Oracle trying to sell one for you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in licenses, it cannibalizes the four, the four fee products. So any of this technology that is free or open source or openly available, if it's good and people will contribute their time to make it better because they don't want to pay fees to these other firms, it's going to hurt the economics of the industry, other industries, but it may be very, very good for users and companies, right? So open source technology has been pretty good, but it hasn't destroyed the software product business or the custom software business. It's been a complement. Okay, emerging platforms based on AI, machine learning for innovation and transactions. Well, the first thing that we looked at was all these smart devices in the home, and they also extend into the car, but um, essentially on your phone. Um, so, you know, Alexa device or the Google Home or the Apple uh, Home products. So you can do shopping, you can do other kinds of searches on the internet. They're using machine learning. There's thousands of apps available for Alexa. They have the Head Start. So this is basically voice control interface for some artificial intelligence technology. 
we're only at the very beginning of what these devices will do. Eventually, they will maybe be controlling a whole bunch of different uh, functions in your home, uh, as well as in your car. Or you'll be seamlessly linking your car with your home. You'll be in your car. You'll tell your, your coffee maker to go on, or your, or, your, or your heating system to start heating up, or you'll just check the security of your home if you're away. So th these kinds of linkages, uh, again, now is this AI and machine learning? Yes to some extent, but it's really fairly simple technology at this point. Um, but that's what we were looking at. What platform is more difficult to build and offer higher value innovation or transaction? Well, I think the innovation platforms, they have the more value. We've actually studied the two of them. I know we're just about out of time. But transaction platforms are like marketplaces, and we've had marketplaces for thousands of years, and they're pretty simple to set up. But innovation platforms to get other companies to buy into your technology and to build their own products and services around your product or service is a harder thing to do. That's why we see a smaller number of innovation platforms than we do transaction platforms. And they're also more valuable. Okay. All right. I think I'm at the end of my time, but uh, thank you very much. Great questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you.